So once again, if you do want to appear in the recording, uh, you can uh, uh, turn your video off and you can still interact uh, uh, through the chat. Um, so we are here today for a dialogue on gastronationalism with Dr. Michele Antonio Fino, who co-authored uh, this book. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Um, Gastronationalismo, unfortunately it is uh, in Italian, but uh, uh, it's a great thing that Michele can also speak English, so uh, he will talk uh, to us about the contents of this book today. Uh, and he has co-authored this book, uh, Gastronationalismo, um, with uh, Anna Claudia Cecconi and Andrea Bazzecchi. Um, uh, I will today present this webinar. I am Chiara Macchi, a member of the law group of the University of Wageningen, and I'm very grateful also to my colleagues uh, uh, from the Wageningen University who are actual experts in food law, unlike me. Uh, and I see uh, in the chat uh, Anna Schevesta, uh, Mirta Alessandrini, Francesco Cazzini, Mariana Vanuzzi, Manu Vanuzzo, sorry, Silvia Rolandi, and uh, the chair of our group, Professor uh, Josephine Van Zeben, and probably others that I cannot see at the moment. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, helping me organize the webinar and for being here. And we were really keen on organizing today's webinar uh, whose theme really resonates with the research and the educational focus of the law group as well. Uh, as you know, we offer a specialization in food law and regulatory affairs. So if you are passionate about these topics and you want to follow a program on these uh, themes, uh, you can check the link in the chat uh, and uh, get in touch with us to, to, do, to know more about this uh, program. Uh, our speaker today is Associate Professor of Roman Law and Rights of Antiquity at the University of Gastronomic Sciences of Polenzo. Let me say that this is a very interesting institution because it was founded in 2004 by the International Nonprofit Association's Law Food in cooperation with the Italian regions of Piedmont and Emilia Romagna. Um, so it is a private non-profit institution focusing on uh, uh, things like renewing farming methods, protecting biodiversity, building an organic relationship between gastronomy and agricultural science. So you can already uh, have a feeling of the fact that uh, uh, this institution has much in common with the Wageningen University in terms of uh, themes and research focus. And you can check their website uh, following the link in the chat. Dr. Fino is not only associate professor at the University of Polenzo and author of 40 publications, including three monographs, but he is also legal advisor to the Italian Federation of Independent Wine Growers. And if I'm not mistaken, he is a wine grower himself. Uh, he also collaborates as a columnist with several technical magazines dedicated to agriculture. But many of us actually know him also because he has a very active uh, and informative Instagram, Instagram profile, unfortunately only in Italian at the moment, uh, in which he organizes live presentations on topical legal issues often related to food and also very accessible to people without a legal or food law background. Uh, and you can find uh, the, the name of his uh, Instagram profile in the chat as well. So without uh, further ado, uh, I warmly welcome uh, Michele and uh, I invite you to share your presentation. And we can start uh, with Michele's presentation, after which, of course, we will have the opportunity to ask questions. OK, I hope you can see my presentation now. Is it on yes. your screens? OK, thank you. So uh, I, I do thank you, Chiara, for your kind presentation. Actually, a lot more than what I deserve. And uh, I'm very happy to be uh, involved in this seminar at Wageningen. First of all, because I've learned the correct pronunciation of Wageningen, that uh, many Italians used to say very simply Wageningen, uh, that is not correct. And today I had the opportunity to readdress my pronunciation. That is always a pleasure, first of all. Secondly, thank you for the warm welcome, welcoming and for the information you have been giving and also for the kindness not to mention my Instagram account name, which is actually the name of my cat, former cat, 20 years ago. Therefore, a bit funny and not exactly professoral, as we would say, as we would say in Italian. 
So let's uh, get into this book that you have already shown to the to the audience. Uh, Gastronationalism, why did Europe become indigestible is actually the title of the book. And this, the undertitle is in the book itself. Not, uh, it's not something I have been adding today for the sake of this presentation. Because actually we started from a concept, gastronationalism, that has been uh, created as a word by Michel de Soucy about 10 years ago, an American sociologist, uh, because we were interested in understanding or at least deepening a bit the knowledge about the relation between uh, uh, the, the modern tendencies uh, to, to split uh, that we can see active in many states, uh, even in member states uh, of and founding member states of the European Union and the food matter. Because actually uh, what we had uh, guessed is that uh, food contributes to an outbreak of nationalism because nationalism in food is easily uh, underestimated. I mean, uh, when you hear someone speaking with very bad words about another country or the population of another country, you probably get uh, really um, discomfortable with these people. You would consider inappropriate such a language. But then when you listen to very bad words or even, or even to a, a, a total lack of appreciation and comprehension of the food traditions of another people, well, most of us just have a, a moment of a laugh uh, or will downgrade the thing not to something really dangerous or so bad per se, but at the end of the day, something funny. Well, we consider this a, an example of banal nationalism, particularly capable of producing long-term bad effects, in particular within the borders of the European Union, because the European Union, uh, despite the will of its founders, has, has not been able to create a whole bunch of culture, among which also gastronomic traditions are part, and therefore, uh, the, the national pride for the food, the dishes, the, 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 the culinary tradition of the different countries have easily filled the gap. Um, and, and this filling the gap reveals itself today in behaviors that are very uh, harsh and lacking any kind of comprehension for uh, foreign traditions. In Italy, you can probably express your opinions with a lot of freedom about any political idea today, and this is not necessarily something good uh, per se, but uh, if you uh, think to say that you cook carbonara using onions or cream, then prepare yourself to a fight back that you, to, that you can never foresee in advance. Because if you think, oh, this is just, you know, peanuts, this is something not important, you will easily and very fast discover that for the Italians, this is crucial. And the funny thing is that it was not crucial this way. Because even Italians used to think that cuisine is so important for them because it has always been. Well, it's not so. We have pointed out in the book that uh, the most of what we call the traditions are very recent, uh, dating back in the 70s. And, and just to mention about carbonara, that is one of beloved recipe of the Italian pasta, it has probably been created in the 30s in the US, in a, in a restaurant of Chicago, owned by people from the north of Tuscany. And in the original recipe, there were cream, there were onions, there were many other things that today uh, people in Italy consider not to be orthodox. So this is just to introduce the topic because this, this is the idea we want to explore in its uh, consequences and to compute these consequences according to uh, a scientific method applied to social sciences in this way. Well, we start with the first slide that pays the toll to one great inspiration we found. Because actually, I'm sorry, uh, there, is a, there is a problem uh, with, with my slide. Ah, oh, no, sorry. Just a moment, uh, because I, I made a mistake. And 
Okay, here we are now. I hope you can see it. The slide that mentions Shabo, or don't you? Not yet. No. Not yet. Okay. So I go. I go sharing it because we had a great inspiration finding these words by Federico Chabot. Uh, Federico Chabot has been a prominent historian in the in the Italian university, and to him is uh, dedicated the the central library of history in the University of Rome, the biggest of the, of the country. Federico Chabot was from Valle d'Aosta, so he was a guy from a frontier, a guy grown within uh, the, 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 the thin borders of a land between mountains, so between France and Italy, between Franco-Provencal language and between different cultures, even religious cultures. Well, this is the text of his prolusion, the book uh, that we have derived it has been reissued in 2018, but this is the prolusion. He spoke at the University of Milan in 1943. And this prolusion is completely against the idea of nation and nationality. Uh, and if you think of the time he has been pronouncing it, this sounds incredible and really reveals how Federico Chabot was a great historian and a great man. He has also been the first president of Aosta Valley after, uh, after freedom in 1945. So he was also engaged in politics uh, in the country. To say a sense of nationality means to say a sense of historical individuality. We talk about nationality because we want to have our place in history. The idea of nation arises and triumphs with the rise and triumph of that great European cultural movement, which has the name of Romanticism. Because actually, it's in Romanticism that individualism becomes a value, that the single man uh, that can, cannot be repeated, a single man that is unique in history and can everything in history, uh, goes substituting the idea of uh, history shaped by reason and shaped by collectivity. That was mostly the, the way the Enlightenment and the philosophers of the Enlightenment used to think of human history. In, during Romanticism, individuals as single persons become crucial in history and the correspondent at uh, the state level of the single individuals is the nation. The nation, therefore, is a very modern creation and is a very dangerous one. According to Chabot, we have paid a, an incredible toll to this uh, idea from Romanticism. An incredible toll that you can measure in the wars that uh, have been fought in Europe since the beginning of the 19th century in order to guarantee to each nation its own state. Hmm? Something that uh, after World War II we thought we could consider over, but actually uh, we have discovered during the last 30 years how strong nationalism can rise in history back uh, after a, a time that you may think you may be thinking was absolutely enough to guarantee this idea would be left into a suitcase not to be used again in history. Nationalism is uh, a really charming idea because it offers the promise of uh, a place in history to a collectivity of individuals. And this is a, enormously more charming than the collective idea of state as the result of categories of individuals uh, and of category of people led by reason, led by logic, and not simply following in order to affirm their own cultural heritage. But as a lawyer, I was mostly interested in trying to find the link between gastro-nationalism and European law. Since the Treaty of Maastricht 1992, European institutions have grasped the importance of culture as a governance tool. We must recognize that until 1992, and if you read the Treaty of Rome, 
you discover it very clearly in 1957, Europe has not had the ambition to create a European culture and to use a European culture to promote the integration between the parts of, of Europe. Uh, we tend to use in our presentation this image. The fathers of the European Economic Community in 1957 were convinced that a spillover could take place. We use the image of spillover because it's very popular during the last two years. But uh, they, were, they were probably thinking that uh, if they were successful in promoting economic conditions that could let people understand the importance and also the advantage of being joining the same economic community, then from the economic field, the perception of the good of being European would have been spilling over into other fields like politics, like finance and monetary policies and by the end, at the end also into culture. So they were confident we start with economy, we start with the free circulation of merchandising, we start with the abolition of uh, uh, tariffs among the six founders member states and then the rest will come. Well, they were probably wrong because in this time, they were and we were waiting for the spillover of uh, a European sensitivity among the citizens of the countries that uh, were part of uh, the European economic community. In the gap left by this late uh, birth of a European culture, the old national cultures rose back. And probably one of the biggest uh, symptoms of it have been the um, tendency during the 80s to promote the, na the, national, the national, national heritage of food related to an origin we will talk about in a brief time from now. So, time has not solved the difficulty of defining a cultural identity. We have said 30 years ago Europe starts thinking of a European culture, but how to give a cultural identity to uh, a continent that have been ravaged for centuries in the name of different religions, that speak dozens of different languages, that have very ancient traditions that uh, shape small groups, sometimes groups that are even at a level that is far, by far more small than the national group uh, corresponding to the state. And actually, the, the motto, unity in diversity, has revealed itself during the last 30 years as something that was actually wishful thinking. And uh, the motto could not avoid the risk of, uh, of being simply a nice way of saying what we would like to be, but actually we have not been able to become. Therefore, from 1992 to today, we have, called, we have collected examples that show well that it remains to the state to answer the identity and cultural questions of citizens with their narratives. And what's surprising, but not so much, is that this national narrative, uh, national cultural narrative, has been not only uh, the narrative of a part of the political field, okay? You could expect from conservative, right-winged uh, political forces this kind of narrative. Actually, it has been homogenous in all the part of the national politics. And the reason is that this outbreak of nationalism, banal nationalism, has not been perceived as really dangerous. And therefore, being left-winged or right-winged in supporting the idea of a superiority of a cultural heritage was not considered good or bad. It was always considered good. And any political party in any part of Europe have dismantled the previous behavior that was not keen, uh, or that, that until the 70s was present, particularly in the left-winged parties, that was not keen to stress the differences between the states, but was on the contrary, keen to uh, enhance 
the homogeneous traits among the different peoples of Europe and the different countries of Europe, according to a, a very popular socialism motto uh, that, that you all know, because uh, you all come from countries that have experienced the presence of uh, socialist and communist parties in the past. So that narrative has been completely swept away from the history of Europe since the 80s. And the new narrative, homogeneously based on the idea of our national culture is the value per se, independently on the consequences of this affirmation, have become the unique narrative that all the, all the parties could share and at the end of the day could promote, with the result that we face today. But what is the cultural identity promoted and why is it a problem according to us? The defense of the diversity of a national character is opposed to any homogenizing and exogenous force at the same time to any endogenous mutation that threatens the maintenance of the status quo. The very bad effect of nationalism we see in particular with regard to food traditions is that not only people refuse any contamination with foreigners' tradition and any uh, possibility of exchange, because when you assume that you are better, well, you are not well disposed for an exchange. It's very simply said. When you concede to the other people to let you taste what they make and, not, and you don't grant them a consideration as au pair, uh, in the field of food traditions, then you are uh, you are considering your national heritage uh, as something that gives you a superior position to any other one, and this is not a good beginning for a dialogue. Okay, and this is the the, the exogenous part that is dangerous with gas nationalism, in our opinion. But there is also an endogenous and very severe problem that we pointed out in particular with the relation to some cases we considered, in particular with the, the case of the halal burger in France. That is, when you have established a, an heritage that is, at the end of the day, taken out of history, individualized, created as something that is no more suffering the effect of relations and mutations, because you you consider that your DNA and you don't accept that, that, that this DNA evolves, then you also are telling to young generations and minorities within the borders of the country, well, your contribution is not something we like to have. You can't contribute to the evolution of the national idea of food and the national identity of food because the national identity of food has been already created established and what we have to do is only to defend it. I hope it's clear. This is a problem within the borders of the country. This is the endogenous problem of gastro-nationalism. This is the problem that leads a student 19 years old coming for the, uh, for the exam to be admitted at our university, ending a nice oral exam nice because he had very good experiences and very good lectures and very good readings before coming to us with this phrase. And at the end of the day, my goal is to become the defender of the authentic tradition of Italian cuisine. The one that doesn't use cream for making carbonara. And you really understand how big is the damage to the cultural tissue, because if a 19 years old guy comes and to be admitted in a university thinks this is something positive to say in face of a commission, well, we have a problem, not Houston, Wagninger and Turing too. We have a big problem because we are, we are facing the effects of a wrong rhetoric narrative on the younger generations that don't think themselves as protagonists of the constant evolution of the gastronomic heritage of a country that is made of relations and is constantly evolving. It's different, today is different to what it was yesterday. No, they feel themselves as defenders of a museum. In this museum or in this tower of the jewels, you are, they have already put 
everything that defines our cultural identity with regard to food, and there is no room for evolution, there is no room anymore for relations, okay? And this is the problematic idea of nation that depends on the fact that we are so easily thinking our nationality in terms of an original demographic set. And we transport it from the field of ethnic, so the, the groups, the ethnic groups, to the field of culture. Because we move what originally was in the field of ethnography, in the field of anthropology, to the field of culture, with the same goal that in, the anthropologists know very well, is the goal that um, animates people when they refuse the meeting with other population, when they refuse to embrace new tradition, when they refuse to give it a try. Because giving it a try, anthropologically, is more dangerous than keeping on the track of the past. Well, in a country that has been created with the Treaty of Rome in 1957, I call it a country, okay? It's wishful thinking on my side too. Let's call it in an international, uh, in an international institution like the European Economic Community built up in 1957 with a precise goal that was not to have another war on the Rhine River as we have been having for every 50 years in Europe since the 17th century. So this was the very basic goal of the European Economic Community. We can't afford, we can't afford that idea of nationality. And we can't afford that idea of nation at the end of the day, okay? The struggle is all between the ideas of an identity we build versus an idea of identity we inherit. And this explains well what we have seen before in the slide about Chabot. Chabot says I, a national, nation needs an identity, but it's not true vice versa. We can have a strong identity without feeling any need for a strong nationality. Nation is a surrogate of identity. It is the fixed surrogate. It is the surrogate of identity that is comfortable because it's a picture when identity is the moving result of continuous relations, is something constantly evolving. Okay, And this is why national identity is nostalgic inevitably. And everything that is nostalgic, sooner or later, becomes fascist in our very personal, but uh, also well-assessed opinion. So, nation and identity, can one live without the other? Our assumption is yes. The book is not a book uh, of desperation. Oh my God, everything has gone uh, rotten and we can't recover from it. It's a book in which um, the critics are more than the compliments, for sure, but uh, the, the goal of writing such a book and to edit such a book in Italy is that innerly we think that the situation can improve. The concept of nation seems to be strongly correlated to that of identity. What establishes belonging to a state is the sharing of common values, a language, a history, marking the border with what is different from it. Well, there is a lot of Wilson's idea of nation state in it, okay? An idea that is 100 years old, and you know because you have been uh, taught uh, by your professors or lecturers in, in the classes of history how uh, bad this idea have been for the peace of the, among the countries during the 20th century, because the idea that uh, all the different populations or the different nations in terms of population need to have their own state is at the basis of uh, the majority of wars that uh, happened during the 20th century, not the last, uh, the, the war in Yugoslavia uh, during the 90s, about 30 years ago. Year after year, we have measured the difficulty of introducing notions of pluralism into the national paradigm. And the question arises, is nation is, nation is still a suitable formula to refer to in order to bring diversity into the discourse of unity? Is it possible to use nation 
if we want to pursue the motto of the European Union, unity in diversity, or if we want to try to find unity in diversity, we have to abandon the idea of nation. Is it possible to think of identity in non-identity through nations? Because the idea of identity in non-identity is an idea that uh, you find in Bauman, you find in Habermas, and is the idea that modern liberal states need to have a, an identity of the state, of the population of the state, that is not an identity as we used to have in the past. Because if we have an identity as we used to have in the past, then we do not accept the differences uh, within the population of a country. We do not accept uh, that all individuals are equal. We do not accept every religious belief because we establish necessarily a hierarchy among them. So modern liberal democracies need an identity that is made of non-identity, apparently an oxymoron, actually the best approximation. The identity of liberal democracy is that we accept the different points of view. And we don't think that a state to survive and the, and the, and the country to work uh, takes that everyone share the same uh, the same uh, bunch of values, the same bunch of beliefs, and uh, and the same cultural heritage. The only element that is needed is tolerance for the different visions, and therefore the only thing that can't be tolerated, according to Popper, as you perfectly know, is intolerance. Everything else is admitted and must be, because this is the identity of modern liberal democracy in the Western world. So, and what culture, therefore, if Europe is based on these values, what culture does pan-Europeanism appeal to foster integration? When Europe in 1992 wants to promote a European culture, what can be promoted if, if the fundamentals of European culture is acceptance, is diversity, is renouncing to having a core of values and cultural heritage. Please remember the failure of the Constitution for Europe. How did it fail? It failed because nationalism in different countries allowed to point out that there was not a common core and even the very weak references to the past were considered unacceptable in different parts of the, of, the, of the European Union. Therefore, here you see really displayed uh, what we want to affirm through the book, that Europe, to be Europe, must be, uh, must be uh, given an identity that is a non-identity, in terms of cultural heritage. But this reveals itself also in the great problem of convincing people of the fact that the idea of Europe is good. If the attempt to suggest a fluid and constructivist identity, that means we build together our identity, we, the immigrants in our country, the people we meet and then move and then move to another country and then get a partner of someone and then bring different cultures in terms of literature, in terms of movies, in terms of food. Well, if the attempt to suggest a fluid and constructivist identity according to a liberal democratic tradition fails, the alternative for a recognition of difference instead brings with it a strong and static identity. And now reflect a moment. What is more, more comfortable? The static identity coming from our history, coming from the suitcase of our traditions, our language, our uh, uh, ideals that derive from the national history or the constructivist identity that we build every day. I speak to the colleagues that, that, that now work in Wageningen and have studied during your, their early years in Italy. Are you building your identity there or are you defending a national identity you bring with you and you use like a, a, Linus, uh, a, a Linus piece of textile 
in order to feel comfortable, even in an environment that is evolving every day, through your contribution. And you know it's great, but maybe sometimes it's not comfortable. Okay? And th in this way, you understand why, among so many strata of our populations, well, the idea of a cultural heritage fixed in a moment, possibly a glorious moment of the past, and treated as a defensive shield against everything that sounds like foreign, unknown, modern, challenging, well, has revealed itself absolutely successful in the political narrative. And food has largely contributed to it. Because food has a lot to do with it. For 30 years, a process has begun that makes food and its culture a powerful tool to represent the link between origin and territory. We have just got a finance from the, Euro, the, the Minister of University in Italy to lead a, a research. We will we, we'll work on it in five universities, 45 researchers from five universities, in order to highlight, when possible, the relation between origin and food and the contradictions of it. Because we are in a moment in history in which Claiming for an origin means everything for people. And this is the result of a cultural movement that has become the basis of a wide marketing strategy that is not only referred to food, uh, just the bra between brackets. This morning at the radio, I listened to a spot for um, uh, a cosmetic cream, okay, from an important French producer whose name is Premier Cru, Premier Cru, for a cream to spread on your face. Premier Cru is the name of a classification invented in Bordeaux in 1855 and, uh, for believe, for, for on behalf of the Emperor Napoleon III and has been used for wine for centuries and now for a cosmetic cream, because when you can recall something that in some way suggests the idea of an origin that is prestigious, of, a, of something that is refined with regard to the raw materials used to create the product, bingo. And this spreads from food field, in which origin has become a mantra, into other fields. And, and if you pay attention to the, to the commercials, you will detect it very easily. So, for 30 years, a process has begun and that makes food and its culture a powerful tool to represent the link between origin and territory, to claim exclusive protection. What exclusive, according to the proper language of private law, means, first of all, extra omnes, okay? My old professor of Roman law at university used to say, what is the first thing you want to do as an owner of something? And nobody could answer. He said, okay, now imagine you are the owner of a nice cake. Very good. What is the first thing that, in, that is in your interest? And with the cake, in our mind, it was immediately clear. Nobody must touch my cake. Okay, the cake, I'm the only one entitled to, to taste the cake. If I want to give a piece of it to someone else, fine, but it's my will. Nobody else can touch it. This is the exclusion connected to property. What is the, the link between this, that is a very material idea of property, and culture? Well, during the 90s, we have started a huge process of privatization of cultural heritage. We have been doing that with the PDOs, with the PGIs, with the TSG, according to the European standard in terms of food, but also with the traditions put into the human heritage according to the UNESCO protocols. Because in the moment we established that the Mediterranean diet is part of human heritage, we are giving it an individuality it has never had. And we are in some way taking it out from the relation of individuals and moving it into a museum and a dangerous museum. Because being a UNESCO protected good, 
the, the Mediterranean diet is entitled to Portugal, Spain, Fran not France, Italy, Greece. Tell me why not France when Italy, okay? When in the Osta Valley, the region of Chabot, for sure, they were not consuming food according to the Mediterranean diet, when probably in Provence, a lot more. You understand? When you put, when you take the tradition from the living, the living broth in which cultural traditions and food traditions, among other traditions, grow and develop, and you put it into a museum, then you fix boundaries. Then you transform it into a shield, into something that becomes sacred in some way and becomes an instrument to get opposed to other population in other countries. So tradition is mine. It makes me unique. And this is the individuality of nationalism. None of you have the right to consider it your own. So uh, this, this recalls me of a, of a friend of mine that was caught at the frontier importing cheese from Spain in France. And at the frontier was asked by the police, oh, do they make cheese in Spain? And he said, actually, yes. And the second question was, and is it good? You understand? This is, this is in, in, the, in the mainstream culture, what we prepare with this constant patrimonialization of uh, the, cultural, uh, the culture of food. Does the identity of local productions, their origin, become the ultimate proof of an authenticity certification process? And moreover, the only thing that matters. People want to know where it has been made. And we see it after Regulation 1169 and uh, low and the slow uh, implementation of the rules about the origin of milk and dairy and about the origin of the primary ingredient that was expected to be implemented through, through um, executive regulations by the Commission, member states of the European Union have started on their own, created their own national scheme for promoting the origin of these goods. And today, Italy leads in the field of milk and dairy with uh, the obsessive repetition that 100% uh, Italian milk is behind these productions. When we know as technicians and we can see very well assessed by many agrarian studies that Italian milk is not by far the best milk that can be used for making cheese. And in many cases, due to the climate change, offers more problems than opportunity. But it doesn't count because the rhetoric has been imposed successfully. However, not in a logic of sharing, indeed, we talk about origin and mutual recognition. Food is not to exchange and to know each other, but of opposition and selfish affirmation. The capitalization, in addition to being a promotional lever for the territory, assumes the function of a political category of governability for the protection of the origin of food and food-related products. Why food? Well, the reason is that the book has been written in Italian, but also has been written in Italy. Uh, the reason is that food in this country has a very important, prominent uh, role, not, not only today, also in the history of capitalism and the economic development of Italy. Uh, it has been the, the food industry that has supported the growth of the first industrialization of Italy during the 19th century. Therefore, food is, is very relevant and important historically. And then, because through the cultural movements, to which even slow food contributed during the 80s and the 90s, particularly, it has been it has been largely spread in the country the idea that typical and local and small producer made and uh, peculiar and in tiny quantity were always good when large production, industrial methods. Uh, factory, large factories were undoubtedly bad. And this kind of rhetoric has been confusing the terms. Today, if you ask someone what is local, what is typical, and what is traditional in Italy, 
you will probably not have a coherent answer from three people you meet in the street. What could represent a model of different economy, therefore, because small productions are a model of different economy, actually flowed from the conditions in which it was formed. The local, that could be a different type of economy and could actually be uh, side by side with the large productions and the large food production in particular, became year after year something different. And the globalization of local productions are, is a process that we are facing for the last 30 years. What used to be culture, shared knowledge, medium among individuals, becomes exclusive feature, reason for opposition, and at the end of the day, my own, my own, okay? Uh, there is, a, there is a, a, a couple of phrases present in the book that Chiara put into the nice uh, uh, presentation of this seminar. Uh, this, this couple of phrases end with uh, an, an antiphrasis, that is, when we talk about our food, we should remember that the objective is not a possession objective, okay? That is evidently, evidently an antiphrasis, because, of course, our, our is a possessive, is possessive objective. But if you translate it instead uh, with, with our only, uh, we could we could use a better probably a better English phrasing to say it. When we talk about our food, we should always remember it. You know, it is not our own food. Okay, our means it comes from our tradition, it comes from our cultural heritage, but is open open to other uh, to other mates. It's open to other consuming people, it's open to exchanges, okay? And should not undergo the food heritage fever, a concept that Aiken uh, put in words in 2016, okay? And, and should not undergo the territorial marketing strategies that insist on placing the origin as the cornerstone of the relationship between the cultural tradition of, of the people and its territory, trying to put the cultural heritage from which a food is derived correctly or incorrectly, because we pointed out also some incorrect processes to derive a food from the culture of, a, of an area. Well, uh, unable to uh, unable to consider this creation as something open to the exchange, something open to the appreciation of other countries and populations and people in general, but on the contrary, closed, like a, like a monopole. The very idea that inspires this heritage fever for the origin is an idea of monopole. If I am able to put it under the seal of a PDO or PGI, I will be the only one making it. Well, I interrogate the lawyers that are listening to, to it to this now, and, and I'm, I'm really eager to listen to your reflection about that. But when I ask to my students after the first classes about PDO and PGI in this university, what a PDO, a protected designation of origin means, they often answer, it means that that type of food can be made only in that region. And this is wrong. Totally wrong, because you can make the, that, that type of food and follow that recipe wherever you want in the world. The only thing that is reserved is a name, is a way to present that food. But it is so confused, the idea of a cultural heritage, and it is so uh, undergone an heritage fever that people think when we protect with a PDO Aceto balsamico tradizionale di Modena, it means we can make that good here only. This is not correct. You can make it wherever you want, in New York if you want. What you can't do is to call it aceto balsamico tradizionale di Modena, but nothing of the method, nothing of the recipe is hidden 
or reserved? Just the name. Why do people forget or don't want to consider that just the name is the content of a designation of origin? Because they are largely influenced by the current rhetoric about the cultural heritage behind food and tend to think to this heritage like property. When you have your garden, what you expect is that nobody enters your garden, okay, with the penalty of a trespass if they do it. And the same people practice an equation between physical property and cultural heritage protected with designations or geographical indications. They say, it's like my garden. I'm the only one that can enter it. Uh, or, of course, I can invite someone visiting it, but it's my will that determines everything. The same for my cultural tradition. Well, it's not so. It's not so. Even the geographical indications according to the scheme of the WTO and the TRIPS agreement are nothing else than names. Okay? On the basis of this cultural, let's say, um, uh, shortly said perspective, we started looking at the regulations of Europe about food related to an origin. Well, we concentrated in particular on Regulation 2081, released in 1992, not just because it's exactly 30 years this year, but because that regulation, and in particular, as it happens often, the whereas of that regulation show very well what the Union, at the time the European Economic Community, had in mind approving Regulation 2081 that created PDO and PGI and introduced them into the European legal field. Well, all the whereas are consistent with the idea that this type of specialties linked to a land were an exception. An exception to the free circulation of merchandises and the free circulation even of names. Okay? But it was an exception adopted for very relevant reasons. And firstly, in the whereas you find the noble ones, people working in internal areas with no access to large market for raw materials, producing goods according to traditional methods with very local raw materials are exposed to higher costs for producing. If they are not uh, allowed promoting their food, marketing their food under a seal that guarantees the origin and the method to arrive its production, they will not be able to recover from the extra costs they suffer. This is absolutely great, obvious, and also noble. But at the end of the whereas you find one that tells that different member states of the European Economic Community had started creating their own national schemes to protect local food produced in limited areas. And in order to avoid, and in order to avoid, the confusion for the consumers, depending on many, on several different uh, national standards of products going around on the markets in Europe, according to the Cassis de Dijon case and the mutual recognition that have been established in 1971, was the biggest threat to the free circulation of merchandises because you can imagine how big was the threat for the competition and the consumer choices if every country could have its own national standard for local and linked to an origin products. Therefore, Europe intervened and the Council of the Ministers at the time, for the Parliament was not yet involved in the process of the legislative process, adopted that regulation. Okay. The nobles' ideas were to increase the availability of product, to allow the farmers to get their, their gain, to favorish uh, the, the fact that farmers remain working in, in rural areas, because if they, if they could get a better income related to their own traditional products, that, that would have increased the probability of that remaining in the inner areas for working and living. So there were 
very good, very good reasons to arrive at that. But one thing is clear: that regulation was for exceptional goods. And if you go on e Ambrosia, the European portal about PDO, PGI, and STG, you will immediately uh, see that the Dutch government or the Belgian government or uh, the German government as well absolutely understood it correctly. Only PG, only goods that were for export that were produced in limited areas, that have the character of a specialty made according to a tradition, and that could need a, an extra protection in order to go on the external market with uh, the certainty of not being imitated and therefore in order to guarantee their producers the right, the fair income, well, there are countries like Italy that this part completely undervalued. Italians thought, oh, finally we have a European seal for our parochialism, for our will to be divided into tiny, tiny and even more tiny areas, each of which with their own specialty. And this has resulted in the big mistake about in the big mistake about PDO and PGI that happened in Italy. Not every product indeed, even if niche, historical, very good, refined and even precious was the subject of the standard approved with Regulation 2081, but only those productions that on the one end had a link with a limited area and on the other needed of a protection that put them in a position to compete fairly on the international market without being defenseless against imitations and usurpations of the name that would frustrate the efforts of producers and the objectives of European protection. Just to summarize with the case, the case Parmesan, okay? Through the Parmesan case one and two, uh, Europe at the end of the day had started a protection of uh, uh, that uh, important cheese production typical of the Emilia region in the north of Italy that, uh, all, that today is able to uh, protect the name of that cheese to a standard that was not just 20 years ago. Okay, And so in this sense, Regulation 2081 and the granting of the PDO to Parmigiano Reggiano has worked. But why? Has it worked? Because Parmigiano Reggiano is largely exported. It goes on the market. It's a, su it's a successful product. And therefore, it's good for imitations. Because when it's successful and goes on the market, imitations come out. No? It's, it's easy to understand. But how many products of the Italian traditions were in that condition? Well, we guess that less than one third of the total amount of PDO and PGI of Italy has really profited of the PDO or PGI recognition. Because another th third has profited time by time, okay, is ongoing in profiting of that recognition, when one third has been harmed. We say it clearly, harmed by the recognition of this protection. But why did Italian protect so many products that did not deserve it? Because very simply, they are not exported for the simple reason that they misunderstood the goal of the regulation 2081, thinking it was finally Europe recognizing how great is our cuisine, how great is our food tradition, how great is our cultural heritage. So, a total mistake under any point of view. The evidence is on our side. If you go on e Ambrosia, you will discover that currently there are uh, about, there are, um, when, you, when you seek for PGI and PDO from Italy, uh, including wines, uh, well, we are talking about uh, between 800 and 900 specialties. OK, but then, but then when you go 
to uh, see what products have been protected, then you discovered huge differences. We did it with uh, a very pointed uh, experiment, going examining the specialties that were approved with the first round in June and July 1996, where the very early specialties have been protected with PDO and PGI in Italy. We uh, just focused on PDO, Okay, and we found that um, that Italy had uh, 50 products protected with the geographical indication in general, when France, during those early two rounds, got 43. Other countries, few, uh, many, many less uh, each of them. We asked ourselves, of those 24 products first promoted to the dignity of PDO, what can we say that all met the requirements that we have identified thanks to the preamble of the regulation 2081? More specifically, was it really a question of loyal and constant productions linked to a limited territory made according to a specification and which, in order to see their value recognized and guarantee adequate prices to remunerate producers or international market, needed a PDO? And the result was no. Let's see this. This slide summarizes one of, uh, of the graphic you find in the book. Let's compare three types of cheese, PDO, that were protected, all of them in the very early protection, early day, 21 June 1996, the first round. Parmigiano Reggiano, mozzarella di bufala campana, casciotto di urbino, three types of cheese. Not the same milk, okay? Parmigiano Reggiano from cow, mozzarella di bufala campana from buffalo, and Casciotta Durbino from uh, sheep and partly from cow, eventually. Uh, the, the data you see refer to 2016 and our official data collected by a foundation, Qualigeo, which is funded by the, the um, Minister for Agriculture in Italy on the purpose of collecting this data and allowing researchers to see that. Well, in 2016, that means 20 years after the recognition of the PDO, we have 3,000 and more than 300 operating units for the Parmigiano Reggiano, 1,350 for mozzarella di bufala, and 44 for casciotta dubbi. If we look at the production, we have 130,000 tons for Parmigiano Reggiano, more than 44,000 tons for mozzarella di bufala every year. Of course, these are production yearly, and more than 200 tons, not 200,000, 200 tons Casciotta d'Urbino. The revenue, well, it's consistent with this. One, more than 1 billion for Parmigiano Reggiano, more than 370 million euro for Mozzarella di Bufala, and 1.85 million euro for Casciotta d'Urbino. Uh, along, uh, at the bottom of the, of the, of the, um, at the bottom of this slide, I put the, the image of the three logos of these three products. If you are interested in curiosity and in history, you see Parmigiano Reggiano is on black and the shape of the logo is not exactly the shape of the current shape of Parmigiano Reggiano round that is taller today, when in the past it was flatter and it was always covered with a black wax. It was sold covered with black wax, when today it is, co it is not covered anymore. So this is an historical logo that recalls the origin of Parmigiano, not the origin in the Middle, in the middle Ages, the origin 50 years ago. Just to, just to witness once more that the, the evolution of traditions is constant. So our interpretation is that just Parmigiano Reggiano among these three was actually compliant with the requirements of Regulation 2081. At the time, it was protected, of course. Mozzarella di Bufala Campana was on the track. The production had started with good figures, and there was the possibility of a growth. And that growth has been supported by the PDO recognition, because Mozzarella di Bufala Campana has started growing on external markets with the protection of the European PDO. But Casciotta d'Urbino was so tiny at the moment of the recognition that it did not profit of it. It could not be helped in growing 
And you guess why? Very simply, because if the production is so tiny, the producers are few, and the costs of promotion, the costs of uh, protection, the costs of the inspections to avoid frauds is all on the shoulder of few producers. Because, according to the uh, Treaty for the Function of the European Union, there can't be help of the state to a consortium of Casciotta d'Urbino in order to do what it has to do as a, a statute goal of it. Because it would result into a, an unfair aid to the companies that are part of that consortium. Therefore, the PDO, with all the costs for implementing the certification that leads to the possibility of using the logo, resulted in a burden, not only unfair, but simply unbearable for the producers of Casciotta d'Urbino. And this can be used for many other types of production, and we show different types of production in the book that can be analyzed and compared according to the same scheme. Just want to quote one among them. Prosciutto di Parma, Prosciutto Toscano, and Prosciutto di Modena. Likely, you never heard of Prosciutto di Modena. The reason is the same of Casciotta d'Urbino, but all the three, Prosciutto di Parma, Prosciutto Toscano and Prosciutto di Modena are PDO. And PDO established long time ago, at the beginning of the protection. Okay, so what did go wrong in our opinion? We have started protecting with the schemes of Europe goods that were not uh, actually the goal of Regulation 2081 because these productions were very tiny, these productions were consumed completely in the area where they are issued, and therefore there was not the need of the extra European protection. I don't know if I'm clear about that. I think my bad English does not allow me to be very clear, but I hope it is at the end of the day. We have, let, we have, we have worn an astronaut, an astronaut uh, complete equipment in order to go buying one kilo bread at the bakery. Yes, uh, the, the astronaut equipment is safe. It's probably the safer thing to wear. It protects from almost everything. But is it needed to go and buy one kilo bread at the bakery? Probably not. Well, what we did with the tiny the tiny PDOs and PGI we've been protecting since the last 20, for the last 20 years, is exactly letting them wear an astronaut equipment, even if they did not need it, okay? And this could be absolutely skipped by simply using collective trademark, certification trademark, or even pure trademarks. But when you have the opportunity of using a public seal like PDO and PGI are, and you are in a country where everyone wants to have a medal on the chest, well, the temptation is irresistible. And this is what happened. It is what happened because an instrument created for the market and the circulation of goods was used also to enhance localistic pride with a logic diametrically opposite to that which was outlined in the preamble of the same standard. Italians started dealing with it like my opportunity to grant a local product the public recognition of Europe for the sake of the local politician that was able to lead the producers to add it. The side effects of it are on the external and the internal level. On the external level, we see this side effect in particular when Europe goes uh, dealing international agreements, like for instance, the CETA with Canada or the JAFTA with Japan. Because when it comes to the moment of protecting the specialties of Europe, what can Europe do? The only thing that can be done is writing a list. Think a moment about that right in a list of PDO and PGI that are protected. Why don't they simply tell Japan or Canada we want to have protected all of us 
all of our PDO and PGI. Because it makes no sense. Because in Italy in particular, but probably also a bit in Spain and in France, we have many tiny PDO and PGI that will never reach the market of Canada. And therefore, to engage into a negotiation in order to obtain protection for these goods makes no sense. And therefore, we compile a list. The list of the products to be protected in Japan and in Canada is a list of about 30 to 40 products that are PDO or PGI in Italy. No more. Out of hundreds. And what's the reason? Do they hate our diversity? No. Simply, commercial negotiation can't find a convenient meeting point, a convenient medium point of negotiation if we affirm that we want all of our specialties protected, even if these specialties are something that we all eat in the area of Urbino or in the area of Modena. On the contrary, the list allows to point out what really goes outside, really goes on the Canadian or Japanese market, and therefore really needs for a protection. But this is not the only effect of misinterpretation, because we have also another effect. Once you started protecting, once you started protecting specialties independently on their market opportunities, then you trigger the will of having such a recognition for your good. And every year in Italy, we have an increasing number of demands in order to obtain PDO and PGI. Because local producers gather, want to promote an association to have a PDO or a PGI, and when they are told, sorry, but this product will never be in need of such a protection because you really don't export nothing. And according to the, the rules and regulations you have established for the production of it, you'll never reach an external market. Why do you want to protect it? And they tell you because our neighbors in the village alongside us has already obtained it. And that, what, what are we? Sons of a minor God. We deserve it as they do. To, to highlight it with an example. We have a delicious focaccia. I don't know if uh, outside you know what focaccia is, a type of uh, bread that is baked only fresh. And in this case, it's a focaccia filled with cheese, okay? It is called focaccia col formaggio, and it's made in the, in the, in the town of Recco, province of Genoa, on the Ligurian Sea, okay? It's a PGI. It's a PGI. I repeat it because it's crucial in the economy of this explanation. It's a PGI, and where can you have it? Only in Recco and two other villages, not in Genoa. And can you transport it and sell it abroad? No. The specification, the language of the production, impose you to eat it fresh only on the, on the sea. Then, please, allow me to understand. Why do you need a European protection for eating a piece of focaccia on the square of Recco? Because if you transport it out of Recco, you can't call it focaccia di Recco anymore. So the PGI does not secure you. You understand the, the, you understand the loop in which we have ended? You understand the quicksand of nationalism in it? To the point that the producers of Recco, during the year of Expo 2015 in Milan, rented a space in, a, in an artisan fair in Milan in order to present their own focaccia, and then the police came and let them close it because they were outside Recco, they were in Milan, and they were promoting a product that, according to the specification they have approved, had to be done in Recco only and consumed in Recco only, in Recco and two other bottles. You understand the, 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 the non-functioning of all of it? How can you explain it? just with the bad influence of a rhetoric. Because those people gather to promote a specification for the Focaccia di Recco, those people got an okay from the local political level in the region Liguria, the people got an okay from the national government in Italy, and at the end of the day, the people got the registration of the PGI at the European level. And this all makes no sense. 
On the other end, and this is the other bad effect that we experience in particular, for the fact that the PDO and PGI, particularly after 20, uh, 2012, when the current uh, uh, standard has been approved with Regulation 1151, have embraced the technological uh, evolution and the technological update for the production of goods, what we face in particular is that uh, local uh, production that have been granted a PDO or a PGI are also made in an industrial way. And this leads people not to trust PDO or PGI because in a rhetoric, in a national rhetoric that always stresses local, artisanal, tiny, exclusive, well, uh, a product made in millions of bottles mm, is less interesting, is not a first category PDO, is not a real specialty. And what we had with this is a flourishing of private standards that go sometimes uh, really fighting against PDO and PGI. And we analyzed a couple of cases about that in the book as well. Uh, for instance, there's no food procedure. The case we analyzed is the Bitto case uh, in Lombardy. The Bitto has been awarded the PDO and the producers of this cheese that only work on high mountain refuse to use the PDO because the PDO was granted also to the dairy that were in the flatland, in the, in the valley, not just on the mountains. And Slow Food was on the side of these rebels, granting them a presidium to protect their, their product outside the PDO and in some way also in, in a clash with the PDO. So we had two sides of, of negative effects related with the misinterpretation of PDO and PGI in our country. Here is a short list of them, uh, just a short list to, to, to summarize them. The first three are international and therefore could be even more interesting for you. Hamburger Alal is a case that uh, uh, raised importance uh, during the last presidential campaign in France for uh, a national uh, fast food company in France launched a menu halal. And these have been considered from the right-winged uh, candidate to the presidency an attempt to the national heritage of France, okay? Uh, a, a declaration of surrendering in front of the invasion of Muslims and so on and so on and so on. Organic and halal, on the other side, is a case that gained attention in, at the international level, but in particular in France, about the way of slaughtering the animals. Because uh, when the organic standard require the, the animal welfare standard, even in slaughtering, the halal way of slaughtering and the, the halal certification uh, promotes a slaughtering that is not considered by many as uh, by many technical uh, advisors as a, a correct way to slaughter an animal respecting its, uh, its welfare. And therefore, we highlight in the book how the counterposition could have been a lot less harsh if only the, part, the, the two parts could be invited in uh, meeting and evolving together about that instead of counterposing one position to the other. Alumicis, Please. Can I suggest that you wrap up so we can have a, a yeah. time for a couple of questions? Absolutely, yes. Alumi is from Cyprus. It, and it's a request for a PDO for a cheese that was made both in the Turkish and in the Greek part, but only for the Greek part in order to be exclusive of the Greek. And for that time, Europe answered no. Uh, and this is a great example of uh, how Europe could lead the evolution in culture. Bitto and Focaccia di Recco, I already mentioned. Piadina Romagnola is a more complex case, but very interesting in terms of national procedure of opposition about the recognition of PGI. And about uh, aceto balsamico PGI, it's what I was telling you before we started this uh, conversation, until this moment, not a conversation, but I hope that we have a conversation from now on, uh, because uh, aceto balsamico PGI is the most uh, astonishing successful case of Italian food industry. During the last 20 years, it went from a few million liters 
to 95 million liters per year produced. It's uh, the most exported PGI of, Europe, of Italy, and is at the basis of the of the position of Euro of Italy among the exporters of vinegar in Europe. Uh, that is a leading position, but there are many flows, and in particular, there are flows in the history of this recognition. There are flows in the link between the land and the production of this good, because the only link that is required is that the mixture of vinegar and concentrated must stays in the area of Modena Reggio Emilia 60 days. After those 60 days, it can be bottled everywhere and it can be marketed everywhere, bearing the name of Aceto Balsamico di Modena. And this is considered uh, by some scholars and some technical advisors as something that really stretches a lot the idea of PGI uh, in modern times and therefore at the end of the day contributes to an outbreak of grass nationalism as we have seen by the consortium of Aceto Balsamico di Modena against Slovenia in 2021 when Slovenia asked for the production for the authorization of technical rules for the making of vinegar in Slovenia that also include the making of balsamic vinegar in Slovenia. The Italians uh, cried like it was an attempt to reduce their sovereignty. Well, actually, as I was telling you in advance before the beginning of uh, the seminar, uh, in 2014, Greece approved technical rules that allow Greece to produce uh, balsamic vinegar. And in 2012, Spain already did the same. Therefore, probably it's a problem against Slovenians. I don't know why, but uh, it would be interesting to go in deep into it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Here is the bibliography. Of course, the slides are, uh, are, uh, are for you. And, um, and in case you want, to deep, you want to see the references that I have quoted during the presentation, the bibliography offers you the opportunity to do it. Thank you very much. And I'm available for the questions, of course. Thank you very much, Michele. Yeah. I think we can take a couple of questions uh, if there are from the floor. Um, I will kindly ask my colleagues to signal if they want to intervene. Uh, I see a raised hand. Yes, Anna, please. Queste sono le informazioni. Thank you very much. Um for this really interesting um, presentation. I hadn't re read the book, so um, it's my first encounter with this um, with this thinking, and uh, I was really triggered uh, in new directions, so that's, uh, that's always really nice. And um, I just wanted to follow your thoughts um, through a little bit more. I think there is a lot to say about the quality schemes regulation. Um, of course, for instance, the commission doesn't like to call a geographical indication scheme, but really prefers the, the uh, emphasis on the quality schemes aspect of the scheme as a whole. Um, and then there's a lot to say from a point of consumer protection that you hinted on, of course, from competition law, whether it creates monopolies and so forth. But if I take your central thesis, which is about um, gastro-nationalism, you could easily argue that perhaps this was the best compromise against gastro-nationalism that was possible in the European Union, because it is not by definition a country-based scheme, but it is in some way a regional-based scheme, and that does go away a little bit from the concept of nationality, right? So perhaps within the European Union, if we don't attempt to define ourselves against the other, let's say the non-European Union, um, this local... Uh, level of identity, uh, if we think about different levels of identity that probably can coexist, is the best compromise um, that even does speak to a certain European way of, of understanding diversity, perhaps. I, I agree with what you say about the fact that it was probably the best compromise we, can, we could afford. And if, if I am allowed to interpret in this way, I think that your point of view living in a country that did not abuse of the quality schemes, in my knowledge, in order to protect any kind of very local and yeah, relevant specialty, you are totally right in this positive vision about them. 
What we found out is that the quality schemes approved in 1992 in a country like Italy that has a tendency to atomism unprecedented in Europe, uh, just, just to mention, we have two aceto balsamico tradizionale, one in Modena and one in Reggio Emilia, okay, different. The standards are completely equal. The only difference is one is named after one city and the other after another city. But the two cities are 25 kilometers one from the other. So actually, it's a violation of the general rules to have two different specialties bearing two names for the same good made in two territories that are so close one to the other. Uh, unfortunately, that could have been the best compromise between the local identities and the European identity at different layers. Unfortunately, I say, because it triggered the tendencies of Italians that since then have protected a bit less than 1,000 specialties with PDO and PGI, only three traditional specialty guarantee, only three, and, it, and they were two until last year, because they don't trust it, because traditional specialty guarantee are not linked to, to a place. There is not a limited area. You can say it's mine for the traditional specialty guaranteed. And not, not to, for, to be forgotten, 5,000 products that are labeled as traditional agricultural product of Italy uh, from a list that every year is updated at the Minister of Agriculture of the country. 5,000. So it's really, we have uh, in some way, let's say, open a small space that could have been used in a fair way, as it was in many counties of Europe, in particular in the northern ones. But unfortunately, it should have been uh, mastered with a lot more strict logic in a country like Italy. That is the the, the, the field in which this research has been conducted. And therefore, we absolutely recognize all the limits of uh, an investigation that is based on the case of Italy. Thank you for your remarks. Thank you, Michele. And uh, I think we can take two more questions because I see uh, Mirta and Silvia raising their hands. So I will start with Mirta. Um, thank you very much, Professor Fino. I would like to go back to the slide where you, where you talk about the lack of definition for artisanal, local, traditional food. Yeah. But my question is, um, do you think that the lack of this legal definition or of for these key terms uh, at the European level, it's something that can be seen in favor of your thesis or how would you interpret it? Well, I, I think that uh, a lack of definition at the European level for these words is unavoidable. It's actually unavoidable. These words are, uh, can, be, uh, given, can be given a definition at a cultural level in every country with very different, with very different nuances. And therefore, uh, to define them at the national, at the international level, at the European level, would result in a compromise that, in order to keep everyone around the table, would be very weak in terms of defining capability. I don't know if I'm clear about that. In Italy, when we have to define artisanal today, we still stick to the laws about labor that have been approved 52 years ago. So the number of laborers in some way define what is artisanal and what not, alongside the fact that the owner of the company is engaged in the production and it's not just organizing the means of production. But uh, this is for Italians and this is for Italy. I think that it would be hardly the same artisanal if we look at other countries. In this way, I think that the definition should be national. But at the same time, they should be accompanied with uh, a, a, a matrix to maintain these national definitions with the implications of this national definition within a European frame. I don't know if I'm clear. I think it's unavoidable that these contents are defined at the national level. But at the same time, I think that Europe should not renounce 
creating a frame and imposing. Let me use imposing in non-technical sense, okay? Because this is not a, an exclusive competence of Europe, so it can impose a thing. But uh, uh, it, it can really uh, persuade the member states to stay within to stay within a frame. And uh, I confirm uh, what you have uh, thank thankfully uh, pointed out that uh, local, typical, artisanal and traditional are key words in the narrative that shapes the will of the consumers and shapes the field in which this research has been led. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, and I think there was also a question by Silvia Rolandi. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting and it's always interesting to have food for thoughts and but I was wondering how if you think that tradition in a sense should or not be protected because it's not really a protection of a product in relation to the land but is more of a way to present a product to consumers yeah. how do you uh, put together the uh, protection of geographical indication and the presidia per se with procedure are the protection of traditions and knowledge or not only a product, but maybe also a way of producing a certain product or uh, how to, a technique to fish. So how, how tradition cannot be uh, protected with geographical indication, but it would be emitted with a procedure? Okay. Thank you for the complex question. Okay, uh, it's a very, very uh, brilliant one, and allows me to, to, to suggest a comparison to the question I have just answered. Actually, according to the Italian sensitivity, PDO and PGI do not protect tradition in any way, because when we read in Regulation 2081, 510 from 20, 2006 and 1151 that tradition is 25 years of loyal and constant practices. This is not tradition according to the national feeling about tradition. OK, when you talk about tradition in this country, minimum, you must mention the Romans uh, when possible. And if not the Romans, Renaissance, uh, because this is the, the, the local feeling. Therefore, PDO and PGI are perceived as something that protect customs that protect way of producing that have established maybe in an area therefore are more suitable for producing for protecting typical instead for protecting traditional and this explains well the success of a of a, a symbol like the presidia by slow food in my opinion because slow food said okay we don't look at 25 years tradition because that is not tradition for us we go searching for very more ancient productions, very more ancient traditions, and only tiny ones, eventually within the borders of a bigger tradition that uses the same name. I think of some types of wine made in an inner area within the borders of a bigger area, with that bears the name of the PDO, for instance, but then into an inner area, there is an area where they work on the on the steep slopes of the mountains, and therefore they grant the pro presidium protection for the vineyards that are cultivated in these very extreme conditions. Elsewhere, when the product uh, they protect is made according a tradition that has not been welcomed in the specification of the PDO or PGI. What happened, for instance, with uh, Bitto and Ribelli del Bitto. Therefore, in the country, the idea of tradition that does not match with the idea of tradition that is promoted by the regulations about PDO and PGI have found uh, a trigger in these regulations, but on the other side has led uh, the consumers, as led the communities, as led associations to promote the research of a real or of a true tradition, have promoted the surpass of the quality schemes of Europe through other types of schemes, not to mention the deco by 
uh, Veronelli, not to mention the protected uh, uh, agricultural traditions that I mentioned before. So the question is uh, a, a, a crucial question, the one you pointed out. The relation between tradition and what is defined as tradition in the uh, regulation today, regulation 1151, is a, a great problem for, uh, uh, for the Italian mainstream uh, consumer and for the Italian association that talk to these consumers. Uh, we try to depict a bit of the contradiction that depend on it, but uh, we absolutely admit uh, we are at the very beginning of the research in this field. And, uh, and uh, if gastronazionalismo has one goal, is to start a series of studies. It is, a, 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 it is not a milestone of sure, for sure. It's a, a, a first result on a in a research that goes on. And we are pretty confident that other will, uh, will find a lot more than what we could. Just uh, being triggered, as uh, your chair has said before, being triggered by the, um, the perspective of this book. That this food is not irrelevant, food is not secondary in the building of the European cultural identity, and food should not be the playground in which we behave without the limits that elsewhere we uh, consider absolutely needed. I, you, I always say during the presentation, if someone tells you Germans are bad, you think, oh, you're a racist. It, if someone tells you German cuisine is horrible, well, a laugh or, okay, it's true, comes out from the, from the mouth of many Italians. Well, this sounds funny, it's not. Because this is exactly the, con the, the, the way the banal nationalism comes back in our lives. Because it's a moment, eh? starting from cuisine, going to movies, TV series, literature, and so, and so, and so. We should not be, we should not be light in uh, being uh, harsh against such uh, a behavior and such uh, and such uh, ideas that are spread today very easily. So very, very simply, this is the summary of the book. Thank you very much, Michele. And of behalf, on behalf also of my Italian uh, colleagues, I would like to say that we will never say that German cuisine is bad. <laughs> Bravi. I will point it Bravo. out. <laughs> or Dutch cuisine for that matters. Uh, thank you very much indeed. It was a very, very interesting debate. Uh, uh, I, I will wrap up now because we are a little bit out, uh, above time. Uh, but I think we started a very uh, stimulated con stimulating conversation today. And uh, as I said, I think uh, uh, the research focus of Michele and his team is quite uh, aligned uh, with the with the research interests of the Wageningen University. So I really hope that we will bring this conversation forward. And I would like to thank all the guests that has that have participated in this webinar and especially all those who have anima animated the, the debate. Um, so thank and thank you very much, Michele, really for making the time to to be with us today. Um, and hopefully we will make this webinar available on our website, so you can follow us on our social media, in particular Twitter and Twitter and LinkedIn, um, where we will share more information about this webinar, other webinars, and also about our specialization, food law and regulatory uh, affairs for all those who are interested in, uh, in learning more about uh, these, uh, these themes. Thank you very much. And, I, do uh, I do thank you. Also, if my sons will probably meme me many times, thanks to the recording and the level of my English. But uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure to suffer it in order to, to allow those that could not attend the meeting to have the recordings of it. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Michele. Thanks. <laughs> Goodbye and until next time. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Thank you.